color contrast and accessibility, not as black and white as it seems. Uh, a little bit about me before I start. So I'm a, a user experience specialist for a company called IQVIA. It's a healthcare tech company. I'm based in Cambridge in the UK. Uh, I work on products and services related to natural language processing, mostly in the uh, life sciences, healthcare, and pharmaceutical industries. I've been doing uh, user experience for probably about 14, 15 years, nine of those working here. Before that, I was still doing UX, but I didn't know it was called UX, didn't know it was a thing. Turned out I'd already been doing it for a while. I actually started my career as a software engineer, working in the exciting new world of virtual reality the first time around in the 1990s. Uh, all this time later and virtual reality offerings are still new again, except it's called spatial computing now, if you're into the Vision Pro. And, uh, that's enough about me, so let's get on to why I'm here. So, like I said, I'm going to talk about color, contrast, and accessibility. Uh, my slides are not moving. Oh, they are, just very slowly. So I'm going to kick off with a quick introduction to accessibility, and in particular, digital accessibility, uh, just in case you're not familiar with the terms. So most of us probably hear the term disability pretty often. But the thing about the term disability is that we shouldn't really think of a person as being disabled, but rather that a person is disabled by their environment. So digital.gov is the US government digital services and their website says, quote, disability is a mismatch between a person and their environment. For the person who isn't able to do something, it's this mismatch that impairs an individual. And the term digital accessibility is about the practice and mindset of designing and building websites, web applications and web-based documents in a way that removes barriers that prevent interaction or access. It's about universality, making something that can be used by as many people as possible. So that means in different environments, for different devices, for the elderly, uh, those with different cultural backgrounds, for people who don't have English as their foreign, as their first language, uh, as well as those uh, with impaired abilities. And digital accessibility is about being flexible. So don't think of users as being disabled by their condition, but by the inability to access a product or a service. Different people have a diverse set of needs. The aim is not to provide a perfect instance of a product, but to make it adaptable for the user. People with low vision need to make the text bigger, uh, while those with peripheral vision loss, uh, so tunnel vision, may need to make the text smaller. Some need high contrast or low contrast or dark mode or an alternative color scheme. And if our products don't allow that flexibility in perceiving, understanding, navigating, and interacting with them, then those barriers to access are disabling the user. And digital accessibility benefits everyone. So around one in five people, um, possibly uh, more, depending on where you get your stats from. So in England and Wales, it's nearer to one in uh, one in four. And in Canada, it's about 27%, um, so between one in three and one in four, uh, are impaired in some way that might be more than you thought uh, um, in terms of the, the number of people that are um, have impairments. We need to make digital products easy for you, easy to use for everyone. And that includes the, the visually and hearing impaired, those with limited mobility or with reading difficulties. And accessible products with a, a lower visual or cognitive load also benefit those with neurodiverse conditions. So that's uh, things like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, sensitivity to flashing lights, dyslexia, dyscalculia, migraines, ADHD, autism, and more. Accessible products benefit people with temporary or situational conditions like injury or illness, uh, noise, poor lighting, or just social constraints and distractions of an open office, a lecture theater, or coffee shop. Products need good design and a good color contrast, images and graphs that are described well navigation and access that works without a mouse, uh, 
uh, video with captions or transcriptions and content just generally in a format that can be used by everyone everywhere. And by considering the digital accessibility, we can make that content more accessible and more under, more easily understood for more people in more locations. That's a benefit for everyone, not just disabled people. And it's important that people don't have to identify as being disabled in order to get the benefit out of a product. There shouldn't be a switch that says, hey, I'm disabled. I need this special version of the interface. So that's some of the benefits of making accessible products. And I've covered the ones on the left, but there's also uh, benefits for business too. So this can help you when you need to get buy-in. So things like it can drive in innovation by solving unanticipated problems or removing architectural, digital, and social barriers. It can enhance the brand by showing a, a genuine commitment to corporate social responsibility. It can enhance business-to-business -business sales. Uh, federal and private organizations are increasingly including non-negotiable accessibility requirements in the procurement process. It can extend market reach by improving the experience for all users, meaning that benefits are seen in all markets. And finally, uh, it, it can uh, reduce the legal risks. So many regions around the world have laws requiring digital accessibility, and increasingly so for the, pub, uh, the private sector, not just the public sector. And this is just increasing all the time. So finally, for this introduction to accessibility, whether we're creating websites, apps, or documents, we're all in this together. And what each of us does makes a difference. And remember, what you do at the start makes it easier at the end, and your content gets published faster. On with the show. So that's digital accessibility. But today, I'm going to drag things right back to basics. And I'm going to talk about color, which is arguably one of the most fundamental aspects of design. And for those without impaired vision, color is often one of the most visual, striking, and memorable aspects of a product. It's also one of the easier aspects of a product to test against accessibility requirements. Think about it. If your users can't distinguish the components on a website due to the color, then you've put up instant barriers to access. You've almost certainly all visited a website and seen bad color combinations or maybe something that doesn't work well in your beloved dark mode. And if you get your colors accessible everywhere in your product, that can be a big first step towards creating accessible products. But don't get me wrong, there's way more to being accessible than just color and contrast. If I take some software or a website like this one, for example, the Forever Edinburgh webpage for people visiting or living in the city, and I changed it so that it had no color at all, or at least what we traditionally identify as color, you'd expect to still be able to use it, wouldn't you? Not very interesting to look at, maybe, but usable. Or if I changed all the colors, it's not going to look as originally intended, but again, you'd you'd hope it would still be usable. And that's probably just as well, because although color might be fundamental, the fact is not everyone does see those colors the same way as you intended as a designer. My point is, in, in the real world, there are color vision deficiencies that prevent people seeing color or that make colors appear different. And designing products that cater for those deficiencies is, or at least it should be, part of a standard approach towards inclusive design. And in our day-to-day -day activities of designing a product, we typically use a variety of tools that help us. And I'm going to talk about why some of our most used color tools might not be up to the job and what's available to improve that. Firstly, uh, an apology. Given that much of this talk is related to accessibility, then for those in the audience who find it hard to see the slides, I want to apologize for ironically having very visually, visually oriented slides. It's hard to do a talk about color and rely on words alone, but I will try and describe what's going on. And I'm going to start with an optical illusion. So I'm sure some of you will have seen this before, but this kind of blows my mind a bit every time I see it. So the picture shows a 3D checkerboard, like a chessboard, only because of low availability of materials and the increased cost of living. This chessboard only has five by five squares. <clears throat> 
And the altern alternating squares are light gray and dark gray in the middle of the boards in light shadow, thanks to a strategically placed cylinder. I've put some large light gray dots on the board, one on a dark square near the edge and one on a light square that's in the shadow in the middle. And the dot in the shadow looks much brighter than the other. But if I connect the dots, you might be able to see that they are in fact the same color. Now the really surprising thing is that the dark square and the light square are also the same color as each other. So if you don't believe me, let's connect the squares instead. All right, mind blown. So I want to do two things with this demonstration. I want to emphasize the importance of contrast in color perception, especially localized contrast. And I want to reset your understanding of what color is. I don't mean like semantically, I mean, my wife have endless discussions, let's not call them arguments, over whether some things are green or blue. What I mean is color's not absolute. Not only do different people perceive colors differently, but we as individuals don't even perceive the same colors consistently. Even as we get older, we perceive some colors differently because we're less able to distinguish blue components of colors. The point is it's not all about color alone. Contrast and context have a massive part to play. Color perception is as much about the physiology of the eye and the human brain processing as it is about light emitting from a computer screen. Contrast is relative. By definition, a difference between two states, a comparison with something else in close association, foreground against background, light against dark. So this idea of contrast being something that's relative to two things in close association is important because it immediately introduces the idea of context. Every single thing exists in the context of the next adjacent thing or its next larger or smaller context. And that means that everything is connected, which of course, if you're a Dirk Gently fan, you'll already appreciate. I often use this quote from Elio Saarinen a Finnish-American architect and a city planner who said, always design a thing by considering it in its next larger context. A chair and a room, a room and a house, a house and an environment, an environment and a city plan. And as we'll get on to later, the question that arises with color is, is how do you measure contrast and how much contrast is enough to make something stand out? So let's get back to the basics. Why even use color in the first place? There are other ways to call attention to something such as compositional aspects like shape, position, spacing, or even motion. But color is one we use a lot because it's a fast and highly effective sensory cue. We use color to do things like attract attention to a particular item especially something important or to apply what we sometimes call editorial salience. We use color to group or differentiate elements on a page or a screen. We use color to attach meaning. That might be with the help of a legend in a visualization or by appealing to a psychological bias or emotion. We use color to enhance appearance, to make things look attractive or harmonious. Why not also make your very useful product also look very beautiful? So having started to use color, what might go wrong? Typical problems might include, well, too many colors is going to look busy. It's going to make you feel like there's too much to process. Clashing colors look harsh and poorly planned. Saturated colors, well, yeah, they look exciting and dynamic, but they get so tiring after a while. Symbolism, maybe we accidentally incorporate inappropriate cultural meaning. And as I mentioned, not everyone can distinguish all colors in the same way. So here's a common example of the cultural issue. Different parts of the world use red or green to mean a positive or a negative change. For example, different emoji systems from different providers have a chart emoji, and they use different colors for an upward trend 
And of course, it depends on the axis. Is pain or delight at the top or the bottom of the chart? On the right is a picture of a screen showing stocks listed on the Japanese stock exchange. Increases in stock price are shown in red, while decreases are in green. And that's the same in China, but it's the opposite of what we might be used to uh, in, in, say, the New York or London Stock Exchange. So that's some of the typical motivations and pitfalls of using color. There's a number of design principles and theories of color to help us achieve the intentions whilst avoiding the pitfalls. Things like choosing a limited palette, using complementary colors, desaturating colors, and being aware of the localization issues. These are all fairly solvable problems. That is, except one, the one where not everyone perceives colors the same. That kind of feels like a, an unsolvable problem, doesn't it? How can you cater for everyone if we're all different? Aren't I going to spend all my time trying to get the colors right without ever really getting there, like trying to touch a rainbow? How am I going to know if I've really done the right thing? Where do I even start? Is it even possible? How much am I allowed to compromise? And what does an acceptable result even look like? So this problem reminded me of a story from the 1950s about the US Air Force wanting to standardize cockpit seats for pilots. They took 10 different measurements of over 4,000 pilots and they averaged them all to come up with the size and shape of a cockpit seat that they thought would fit the vast majority of the pilots. What happened was that the number of people for whom that average seat actually matched was zero. There was not a single person who matched the average values of each of the 10 dimensions. And there, there was no such thing as an average pilot, and there's no such thing as an average user. And in the face of such problems, we as designers often turn to directives and guidance from those who know about these things because, well, this is a perennial problem, right? We might look at the web content accessibility guidelines. I'm just going to call these the guidelines because that's easier to say. Some people might say WCAG, WCAG, or just WCAG. So just to quickly explain the compliance levels of the guidelines, there's dozens of different criteria, uh, just a few of them to do with color. And they have one of three ratings, A, AA, and AAA. The lowest A rating is uh, it's good. It doesn't really get us very far. The AA rating is the general recommendation for broadly achievable accessibility and is the typical target for um, legal uh, and uh, design policies. The AAA ratings very hard to satisfy for all the criteria across the board for any significantly sized product. There's some really good criteria in there, but the AAA level is sadly very often left out. So let's have a look at what the guidelines tell us to do about color. The guidelines say Color should not be used as the sole method of conveying or distinguishing content. And this is one guideline that I'm forever quoting at people. So as an example, say you had a color-coded map, you could also provide tables or filters or easy search capabilities in a separate control, something that helps users to explore the content separately to the map and without the need for color. The next point from the guidelines is that text should have a contrast ratio of at least 4.5 to 1 compared to the background. That's for a AA conformance level. The AAA contrast level is 7 to 1, and this is another directive that I'm constantly checking up on. The next bit of guidance is similar for large text. So large text typically means 18 point. 24 pixels or bigger, and that should have a contrast ratio of at least three to one. So there's an additional stipulation for links, and that is the color alone is not used to distinguish links unless the contrast ratio is at least three to one, and an additional distinction is given on hover or focus, 
like it becomes underlined, which you, you often see on web pages. So that's basically all we get from the guidelines and nothing noticeably, nothing about catering for various types of color vision deficiencies. And why might that be? Well, the key is in the first item. Color is not used as the sole method of conveying or distinguishing content. So that almost makes color irrelevant or at least non-essential because there should always be another way to consume the content that doesn't depend on the color. Obviously, we still make use of color because it's one of the attributes of a display that many people respond fastest to, but we can use other compositional dimensions like size and shape, as I mentioned earlier. It's the middle item that I'm going to concentrate today, uh, ensuring contrast ratios for text are set at a suitable level. So let's take a simple example for contrast ratio. Say we want to use a shade of gray for some text, perhaps some secondary text like placeholders or guidance information. I want it not too dark to look like our main body text, but not too light to make it hard to see on a white background. So I choose a mid gray uh, and hex colors, that's 80, 80, 80. And let's assume that I'm aware of the contrast requirements. And by the way, that might be a big assumption because a lot of people are not aware of those requirements. But mid gray sounds like a perfectly reasonable choice, doesn't it? Exactly halfway between black and white. But I'll just go and check it in my favorite contrast checking tool anyway. And lo and behold, it's got a contrast ratio against the white background of 3.94 to one. So it doesn't meet the guidelines. Remember, we want at least 4.5. So what am I going to do? Well, maybe a bit predictably, I'm just going to go to my favorite color tool and see if I can nudge that gray color slightly to make it darker to achieve the required contrast. 767676 seven, turns out to be the lightest gray I'm allowed to use on a white background and still have a contrast ratio of at least 4.5 to 1. But the problem is I just used the contrast value of 4.5 as more of a target instead of a limit. My target was to meet the criteria, tick a box in my accessibility compliance while giving up as little ground as possible against my original desire for mid gray. And this, this is exactly how treating the limits as targets ends up being a common practice instead of respecting the at least aspect of the requirements. Yes, a ratio of four and a half ticks the box, but hey, look, isn't a ratio of six even better? And a value of seven would make us AAA compliant and still be distinguishable compared to even an off black text that we might use for our main text. Here's another scenario. Say you're a designer uh, at a popular company, or maybe not so popular these days, and the branding division where you work insists that you use your company's color for some text or as a background color. No mucking about with the colors is the messaging from marketing. And you're aware of the need to use a color contrast checker to make sure that your colors meet accessibility requirements. And you check the contrast and it's a no go. The contrast ratio is just three to one, not even close to the four and a half. You're about to complain that the blue and the white combination can't be used for text and that a black and blue combination uh, actually has a much better contrast of about seven to one, so nearly triple A level. But something stops you because something weird's happening. You're finding that the white on the blue is easier to read than the black on blue. So what's going on? The numbers are very clear. Black is better than white. The numbers don't lie, but the eyes, they're not so sure. If you've had to deal with this, I feel your pain. I've spoken to so many people with issues like this. It comes up again and again. I first had to deal with this years ago and I was left with lots of questions. And it wasn't until much later that I understood what was going on. And that's the next bit of this talk. So the problem is that the contrast algorithm used by the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, and therefore just about every contrast checker you can find, 
is simplistic, well, relatively simplistic, and it's out of date. It's essentially not fit for purpose. It was, uh, it, it was built at a time when uh, you know cathode ray tubes were in use. And the guidelines and the algorithms to de determine color contrast are set to change in an upcoming version three of the guidelines. Uh, although that's still years away, people should be aware of what's coming because you're going to be seeing references to it already. So the issues with the current algorithms are popularly illustrated with various hues of orange and blue backgrounds. The contrast shown uh, here for uh, both white and black text. You can see for white on orange, the contrast is about three. And for black, it's nearly seven. And for white on this particular shade of blue, it's a bit darker than the Twitter blue. It's about, well, it's just below four. And for black on blue, it's five and a half. So the calculations shown here use the contrast ratio algorithm from version two of the guidelines. Personally, I find the white text easier to read in both cases, but I should note here that not everyone we'll find the white text easier to read. People are diverse and our, our vision systems vary, not just with age and condition or type of deficiency, but we have different display equipment, different environments, different corrective devices, and different impressions of what is normal. For version three of the guidelines, there's a new contrast algorithm being developed called the Advanced Perceptual Contrast Algorithm, or APCA for short, as that's a bit of a mouthful, or I4. And it's been developed independently and it's still in beta, so it's subject to change at any time. But it does explain these anomalies that I've been trying to understand for years. So there's a web page with a contrast checker for APCA. You'll have to get over how this color, color contrast checker looks. Believe it or not, this has been toned down since it was first released. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about APCA because there's a lot of information on the website. All this stuff at the bottom is related to showing what sort of page content suitable for this color combination and what font size might be required at a given font weight in order to be legible. Font legibility is a whole separate world of pain. If you want to see the algorithm, there's a JavaScript code sample linked from the GitHub page, but do check the license if you're going to use it. If you're just after the APCO contrast checker tool, you can find it at the first link shown on this page. And the key feature of this new contrast algorithm is that it takes into account the way that the human vision system perceives color, in particularly on self-illuminated displays, i.e. modern screens. So in the next set of slides, I'm going to do a deep dive into how the old and the new algorithms compare. So don't worry if you're struggling to, to follow along. I'll come back to what it all means afterwards. So let's start off by looking at contrast levels for the current guidelines. In this range of 17 background colors, ranging in what we think of as a linear fashion from black to white, you can see the white circles in the foreground against each point along the gradient. The contrast ratios for each point along the gradient range from 21 down to 1, based on the current version 2 of the guidelines. Now, I've replaced some of the circles. I'm showing thin rings where the contrast is high, i.e. above the guidelines, AAA requirement is 7 to 1. I'm showing thick donut rings in the middle where it's above 4.5, which is the AA requirement. And then there's solid circles where the contrast is too low and doesn't meet the guidelines of four to one, four and a half to one. Think of the symbols like food. The solid black forest ghetto just isn't healthy for you. The donut ring might be acceptable, but really the Greek sesame wholemeal bread ring is the healthiest option. And I'm going to use this notation for the rest of the slides, but the different circles that is, not the food. So the first six points on our spectrum fall into the AAA band. The next two into the AA band, 
and all the rest are just too low or unhealthy, if you like, to meet the requirements. And if we plot those contrast ratios on a chart, you can see that the calculated contrast decreases non-linearly from left to right, from 21 down to 1. Now, if I repeat all this for a black foreground color instead of white, you can see the contrast increases from left to right as expected. The leftmost half has a contrast that's too low, and the rest meets AA or AAA requirements. In both cases, that you can see that the AA band is actually quite narrow, which is another indication that we shouldn't be too afraid to look at trying to meet double, uh, AAA guidelines, not just AA. So we've compared white foregrounds, uh, black foregrounds. And if we wanted to always use the foreground color with the highest possible contrast, then the optimal color is going to change halfway along the scale, as you can see here. At the extremes, black works best on white, and white works black, uh, best on black. And they get progressively worse on shades of gray until the optimal color flips midway. So this almost symmetrical model of color contrast is part of the underlying problem of the current algorithm. The human vision system mostly doesn't really perceive dark on light with the same intensity as it does light on dark. It's more tuned towards light on dark, one reason why dark modes are popular. Now, for the next set of charts, I'm going to do the same thing, but I'm going to use the new APCA algorithm planned for version 3 of the guidelines. Unfortunately, to make things awkward, the APCA method doesn't use the same range of numbers, which might seem a bit confusing. Firstly, the range starts at 0, not 1, which is good. Secondly, the values range between 0 and about 108, which honestly sounds a bit random. Why not just make it go up to 100? Thirdly, there's a sign to the value, positive for dark and light, and negative for light and dark, i.e. your typical dark mode. For the rest of this talk, I'm just going to ignore that sign. On this new range, then, as a guide, uh, WCAG's AA requirement of 4.5 to 1 maps to about 60, and the AAA requirement of 7 to 1 maps to 75. However, there's a twist, which is that the APCA method has different requirements for different use cases. So these minimum contrasts are for fluent text, which means no more than a couple of lines of easily readable text. For body text, which means more than a couple of lines of continuous text, then the requirements increase by 15 points on the scale. For the rest of this talk, I'm going to assume the use of fluent non-body text, things like forms, fields, menus, navigation, labels, and the like. Here's the APCA contrast values for white foregrounds on our background gradient. The values range from about 108 down to zero, as I said before. Here at the bottom is the extent of the AAA and AA bands. and the contrasts plotted on the chart. Now you'll notice immediately that the fall off of contrast is different to that of the WCAG2 values. It's still non-linear, but now it falls slowly on the left and then gets more rapid. So let's look at the extent of those bands for current guidelines and the new APCA method. You can see that the narrow AA band in the middle has shifted to the right a white foreground gets more high contrast AAA slots, that's the thin bread rings, using the APCA method. Now let's use the black foreground and chart the contrasts again. And you can see on the right hand side that a black foreground gets fewer high contrast slots than for, for the current algorithm. And you'll notice something else interesting on the chart here though. Firstly, there's a cutoff below which a dark foreground and a dark background fail to register any contrast on the scale. And secondly, the gradient of the chart approximates a much more linear shape for the remaining slots. So let's compare the extent of those bands again for black foregrounds 
the current guidelines and the new APCA method, you can see that the AA band in the middle has shifted far to the right. And as I say, a black foreground gets far fewer high contrast AAA slots. That's the thin bread rings using the APCA method. So like we did with the version two of the guidelines algorithm, uh, if we want to always use a foreground color with the highest contrast, then the preferred choice of foreground color will change somewhere along the scale. But with APCA, it's not halfway along anymore. It's about 60% of the way along. And for one slot on our grayscale, then the APCA method says there's no foreground color, either black or white, that can even meet the AA requirements. And remember, this is for non-body text. So for a typical body text, you'd be excluded from using all five of those slots that have a contrast of lower than 75. So what this is saying is that given our gradient of background colors from dark to light, then white is generally perceived as being a greater contrast more of the time. We no longer have the symmetrical scenario that we saw with WCAG 2. Your eyes are probably glazing over at this point, a bit like the donut. So this talk is supposed to be about color and here I am blasting you with too much information about all those boring grayscales. So let's look at how the APCA algorithm compares for our orange and blue that we saw earlier. And surprisingly, the contrast compliance is completely reversed. It turns out that the APCA model says that white really is better on orange and blue after all. For white and orange, the contrast value is now higher at 61 compared to 48 for black and orange. And similarly for white and blue, that's a value of 70 compared to 39 for black on blue. And this makes so much more sense for what I think my eyes are actually perceiving. If any of you have been through a company rebrand recently and have ended up having to deal with a color similar to one of these, then things might not be as bad as you thought. And I can hear you wondering, what about Twitter Blair? Uh, where black previously had a much higher contrast compared to white. And that makes sense too now with the APCA algorithm saying that white is indeed better than black with a contrast value of 61 versus 48. So finally, a mystery solved that's been bothering me for years. Why were Twitter and others going against the WCAG 2 recommendations and not doing anything about it? The WCAG algorithm doesn't account for real human perception of colors whereas the APCA method really does seem to match up with what we observe. Earlier I talked about how trying to use the popular mid-gray also failed to meet the current guidelines. Well, another bit of good news is that under the APCA scheme, that this mid-gray color fits right between the AA and AAA requirements, i.e. between 60 and 75. So all those instances where people are instinctively using mid-gray and not checking the contrast levels, they are currently failing the contrast compliance, but they would pass under APCA. On the other hand, if they were using mid-gray against a black background and currently passing, well, that combination will fail miserably under APCA. Rather than just pick out a couple of particular problem colors, let's see how things compare against a much broader range of colors. So on this chart, I've shown the preferred foreground color, either black or white, against the whole range of colors. And I've used the same notation of circles as before to show the level of contrast. I'm using the HSL color space, and I'll come back to color spaces towards the end of this talk. Using the current contrast algorithm then, black or white will supposedly give a suitable contrast against any of these colors. You can see there's no solid circles indicating a very unhealthy ratio below four and a half to one. Black works well in the yellows and greens and the light blues. Black's also pervasive as the preferred color where the saturation is very low at the top. White only works well in the dark reds and especially well in the deeper blues. But look at how the new APCA contrast calculations compare. You can see on the right that the white takes over much more as the preferred foreground color. White looks to be very high contrast in that large area of blues, pinks and reds. 
black isn't so great for that large region of yellows and greens as previously thought. And there's a region of solid circles indicating that the minimum required contrast can't be met by either black or white. So we really should stay away from those colors. So that's an overview of how version three of the guidelines might improve the way we check our designs for meeting contrast requirements. We potentially have new tools to help us make, uh, take human perception into account. But as I said earlier, version three is still a while away. So where does that leave us? We appear to understand the problem. The APCA algorithm corrects it, but is it the solution? Or is it a solution that we can use right now at least? And that's where things get complicated. Right now, we can't all start using this new tool because, well, version two of the guidelines are still here. The laws are still here. BPATS, which is voluntary product accessibility templates. They're still here being based on version two. Company design requirements and policies are still here. And they all typically reference version 2.1 of the guidelines or even earlier in occasions. It's still too early to switch our tools. It's not practical or desirable to go back and fix all the work we've done before. But for a while, many of us aren't even going to be able to improve things going forward either. And that kind of hurts now that we know how to improve. Those of us not bound legally or otherwise to follow the guidelines, for those of us who just choose to flout them anyway, may have the flexibi uh, flexibility to choose better. Twitter, for example, has been using white on blue forever. Were they right? Current guidelines says no. APCA says, yeah, they were right. The rest of us, for now, armed with new tools, could maybe constrain ourselves further by ensuring that wherever possible, we conform to current and upcoming guidelines. Although that kind of feels like a future-proofing exercise that can't let go of the past. It also reduces the usable range of our color palette. For example, here with a white foreground, we could only use color combinations that get at least a AA rating on both models. That means the leftmost eight for non-body text and fewer for body text. With a black foreground, we can only use the rightmost six or four for body text. Put them together and there's a set of colors in the middle that we'd have to abandon because there's no way to meet both criteria. And worse for body text. Admittedly, we'd be removing some color combinations that were questionable anyway. So the end result would at least end up being better for users due to fewer poor color combinations being used. The people behind APCA have in fact created a tool called Bridge PCA, uh, which does exactly this. It's backwards compatible with WCAG 2 in terms of the range of the contrast ratio. It still gives the APCA contrast, but also a WCAG 2 style of contrast ratio. But because this is still a relatively simple tool that's intended to cover multiple use cases, the WCAG star ratios it gives are based on the use of continuous body text, not on the smaller amounts of text for labels, forms, and navigation, the fluent text. And that means that you'll find using this tool will constrain you quite a lot more than you're used to, but all the better for your users, right? I have in the past previously given a talk on biases and the main takeaway was just a generally heightened awareness of bias everywhere. Bias is encapsulated in our tools, our processes and the same old reusable patterns that we fall back on every day. The more we're aware that potential bias, the more we realize how we're nudged down certain paths by those tools. And the humble contrast checker appears to be one such tool that's been around for a long time. In the longer term, if and when APCA becomes part of WCAG 3, and that seems to be the trajectory, then there's a long waterfall of change required from initial release of new guidelines to early adoption 
to broader awareness, driving new tools and adapting existing tools, rewriting policies through organizational change or organizational design groups, all contributing to what finally becomes the new normal. It's inevitable that some contrast tools in use won't be maintained, but new ones have come along. And contrast checkers embedded into desktop software can't be changed without updates, but modern online tools such as browser-based extensions or server-side design frameworks like Figma, Sketch, etc. can probably drive along change pretty quickly. In the meantime, we'll almost certainly have to support both contrast models for some time. I'll just cover a couple of quick examples where APCA is already making itself and already making it into existing tools. So here you can see Chrome DevTools already has a setting in its experiments tab to switch to using APCA contrast checker instead of the existing guidelines. I have to admit, I found the DevTools experiment a bit fiddly to use, and last time I checked, it was using a rather outdated APCA model, but it may have changed. The Stark Accessibility Tools plugin for Figma has an option to switch the contrast model between version 2 and version 3, i.e. WCAG 2 and APCA, and thankfully that's included in the free plan. Stark is available for Sketch and XD as well. And in fact, I noticed recently that even since I put this talk together, the usual contrast plugin I was using in Figma now has a switch at the bottom for using the APCA algorithm instead. And I think we'll, we'll, we'll see more and more options like this in time, so do look out for them. So I'm nearly done here, um, but I wanted to share some other important tips related to color contrast. The most common color space in web development is RGB or sRGB, historically popular because of TV screens and other displays are built using red, green and blue dots or pixels. It's an additive color space. You turn up the amounts of red, green or blue and they combine to give a different color. And color chooser tools usually provide us with controls that let us adjust the relative amounts of red, green, and blue. If you know roughly what color you want, it's, it's really hard to home in on it. It's like trying to mix paints. HSL is another popular color space where you can adjust the hue independently and then adjust the saturation and lightness, which feels a bit more intuitive to control. But it turns out that these color spaces aren't actually very helpful when choosing a palette where you're gonna be using the colors in close proximity. What isn't obvious is that changing any one of these variables has the byproduct of changing the contrast at the same time. Whether you're using the contrast algorithm from version two of the guidelines or the new APCA method, the calculated contrast of a color is primarily determined by the luminosity, i.e. how light or dark it is. For the purposes of accessibility, it's important to understand that the brain processes color and luminosity different as we saw in that optical illusion earlier. We had the same colors, but being perceived differently. If you fiddle with the different sliders of the RGB color space or the HSL color space, you're also adjusting the luminosity and therefore the perceived contrast. Changing the lightness obviously has a big impact on the luminosity, but changing the hue changes luminosity as well, as I'll demonstrate in a moment. But there are other color spaces though, like HSL UV, which you can see here, and also the CIE LUV color spaces. In these color spaces, when you adjust the hue or the saturation, you get a color of the exact same luminosity and therefore the same contrast. Changing the lightness here is the only variable that affects luminosity. If you're into 3D visualizations, then check out the CIE Lab color space, which is along a similar vein, but ideally for that one, you'll be wanting to use floating point values rather than integers. There are some downsides in that the range of the colors in these color spaces don't quite include all the colors you can find in your RGB or HSL color spaces. So let's have a quick look at the range of colors from the HSL color space. Here's a rich strawberry red color on the left. And we create a range of colors by 
adjusting just the hue in the HSL color space. And it should be clear to most people that the lemons and limes are brighter, while the blueberries and plums are darker, especially if presented on a dark background. So just to make that even clearer, let's convert this to grayscale so that we're not biased by the color. See how much we're affecting the brightness and the contrast just by changing the hue. The HSL color space is a really messy and unpredictable space to work in. By the way, converting to grayscale is a really nice way of looking at the design of your product, because if you do that and you suddenly realize, oh, I can't tell what I'm doing anymore, or I can't tell the difference between this and that, well then, yeah, that's what some people might be experiencing. You'll see how much you're relying on the color alone. Now, if you start with the same red color in the HSL UV color space, um, we adjust the hue in the same way. You can see the yellows and greens don't get anywhere near so bright and the blues and purples don't get anywhere near so dark. Looking at that in a grayscale conversion again, you can see how much less the change in hue has on the contrast. Converting an image to grayscale like I have here isn't quite the same as changing the lightness of the colors individually in your color chooser, but it's a useful quick and dirty shortcut. Here's the two color ranges together, HSL and HSL UV, so you can compare what's going on. And here they are, both converted to grayscale. So to look at the numbers behind what's really going on, let's have a look at the actual values for the contrast ratios against the white or the black background. And I'm gonna use the current WCAG2 algorithms here. As we adjust the hue in the HSL color space, the contrast varies between one and a half and 9.6 on a white background, or 2.2 and 13.9 on a black background. Yellow and deep blue are the extremes here. But using the HSL color space, HSL UV color space, we can see the contrast ratios really are completely different. So if you want to build a color palette for a visualization where maybe you don't want to bias the data by using a palette mixing brighter, more attractive, or darker, duller colors, then you may want to consider a more human-friendly color space like HSL UV. Of course, sometimes you do want a difference in contrast, especially where you want users with color deficiencies to be able to distinguish between colors more easily. However, color spaces like HSL UV also make that much more, more predictable as well, because changing the lightness variable in these spaces shifts the contrast in a completely predictable way, independently of the hue and the saturation. So here the middle row and the bottom row of colors are reached by increasing the lightness value of all the top colors. And it creates a brighter color set that also has constant contrast across its entire range. And that's the case whether you're using the contrast algorithm from version two of the guidelines or version three, the APCA algorithm. So just to conclude, there's a lot to unpack with everything I mentioned today. But here's a summary of the takeaways. Not everyone can distinguish all colors, but contrast is an important factor that helps with that. Color and color contrast is probably way more complicated than you, than you might have thought. Don't treat guideline contrast limits as targets like the four and a half to one ratio for AA compliance. If you like targets, try reaching for AAA compliance rather than AA. Be wary of using black and white text against some uh, mid-range colors like the blues and the oranges that we saw earlier. Watch out for new guidance or contrast algorithms coming in version three of the guidelines, but don't jump the gun by switching too soon. Give the bridge PCA tool a go that I mentioned earlier. Experiment with human-friendly color spaces like HSL UV and see if they work for you. And I still didn't answer the question of how we can cater for everyone, whatever their ability to perceive color. That's still a huge topic with many approaches, but I hope that I've got one step closer
by an increased understanding and having a greater awareness of what's actually going on. And thanks for listening.